Hello and welcome to the Vino Karma Project. My name is Amanda Layden and we have a special guest with us today. Today we have the amazing Cornelia Shipley. Cornelia is the founder of 3C Consulting and a sought after speaker, professional development and diversity consultant and strategic planning expert who works with clients to expand their capacity, increase their capability, and drive clarity into the organization to ultimately increase the retention and advancement of mission-critical talent. She and her team have worked with a multitude of organizations, and so today we're going to talk to her about all things diversity, equity, and inclusion, and hopefully get some answers in terms of things that companies should really be considering right now. So Cornelia, it's awesome, of course, to see you as always and to have you here. So welcome to the Vino Karma Project. Well, Amanda, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here on uh, on this reasonably snowy day, right? It's 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 not snowy here in Atlanta, but uh, this weather has been crazy. <laughs> I am so happy that it's not snowing in San Diego because that would be very strange. <laughs> that, would be, that would be. That would be. Well, it's good to see you. It's good to you see too. You. Um, so let's just dive right in. Tell me a little bit about you and your work and what your company does um, that helps organizations impact diversity, equity, inclusion, and representation. Absolutely. So we've been around for 15 years. We celebrate 15 years in November. Yay. And yay! <laughs> and uh, we really do specialize in the space of helping organizations, specifically the le- enterprise wide leadership of those organizations. And in our clients, that's typically the director level and above, really think through strategically the work that needs to be done from a leadership perspective to really retain and advance their mission critical talent. And I think the thing that really, from our clients' perspective, sets us apart is is we come from the space of if you've designed the environment systems processes etc so that even the most marginalized in your organizations can thrive everyone will win Mm. and you'll create an atmosphere where people want to stay and that becomes even more important when we think about you know statistics from you know a recent Harvard review study I was reading recently in conjunction with another study I was reading from UCLA that talked about the fact that the next generation of of workforce inhabitants 39% of them are going to be self-identifying as either non-binary or transgender and we're talking about people who are 21 22 23 24 And what's important about that in my mind is, you know, federal law has settled a lot of issues around that, right? Around how you're supposed to treat non-binary people and transgender folks and in, in all the right ways. But the challenge, the problem for leaders, whether it's around transgendered or race or women or whatever, is that we haven't figured out how to navigate those changes. And with the Mm -hmm. recent events, you know, from the racial uprising and the riot, what's really clear is organizations are now having to be much more transparent and having to make decisions that in the past, they just didn't have to make. And so Mm -hmm. now I'm having conversations about policies and transparency and ramifications and accountability in ways that are just really different than what was required, you know, in three years ago. Oh, yes. I want to talk a little bit um, about marginalized communities in a second, because there's something I think that's happening in America around a misnomer about empowering marginalized, marginalized communities. But one of the questions I have for you right now is, what are the questions that leaders of organizations, so those leaders that you work with, you and your team work with, need to be asking themselves right now as it pertains to DE&I? I think the first question that they have to ask themselves is, is why is this the initiative that they've allowed to fail? Right? If, you, if you look at the history of organizations and you look at the history of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, it is the project that organizations have allowed to fail. They are okay with not hitting their targets. And so, you know, you've got to be able to have a com- candid conversation about why that is. It's my belief that in large part, the reason for that is because people aren't help, help, aren't comfortable holding other people accountable to delivering cases, <laughs> right? Cases of beer, cases of wine. They're not comfortable when people don't hit their number, much less 
being mm-hmm. comfortable with addressing and dealing with people around people issues that are really tough to talk about. And so, you know, the place that we typically start with leadership is to say, let's talk about why you've been okay with this, the status that you have right now. Mm-hmm. And if you're not, are you ready, willing, and able? And those are three very distinct questions because you could be ready, but not willing. You could be ready and willing, but not able. You could not be able, but ready, right? Mm -hmm. You could have some ability issues in your culture that say, "Mm -mm, you know, we think we're ready as a leadership team, but our our climate isn't able to handle this right now. Mm -hmm. So you've got to be clear. Are you ready, willing, and able to take on what's necessary and the ways in which now your constituency base, your consumers, your vendors, your suppliers are going to be holding you accountable? And so are you ready to deal with that? And if you're not, how are you defining diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging? And what are the targets that you are ready to take on and hold people accountable to? Oh, that's so powerful. I think, you know, one of the things that I noticed that has happened, particularly over the past year, is companies giving lip service to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and belonging, and representation and then it backfiring on them. Uh, I don't know if there's anything you can speak to with regards to that about its importance or anything that you can think of um, that's allowed to be talked about in the public domain where we can bring to the fore that example of why, again, like it's that grounding truth is so important in today's workforce and in today's society. I mean, I think, you know, there've been a couple of recent recent things that have happened that I, that I can think of. Uh, I think the, the most recent headline has been the one um, with the Bachelor fr- franchise, oh, mm-hmm. right? um, and I I haven't watched the Bachelor I think since Tristan Sutter was the Bachelor. <laughs> right? so we're, I think we're talking about like season two. So, and I think they're on like season two hundred and eighty nine. So at least. <laughs> so so yeah. So I I think logistically, you know, when we get to talking about. Um, you know, what is it that organizations need to be doing when the public domain happens is either you need to immediately hire a crisis manager who can now come in and help you speak. And if you're unaware of, you know, let me tell you what I know about the situation. So I don't know that I have all my details, but my understanding is a contestant on the current bachelorette, bachelor, the bachelor's a black man, and this woman went to some antebellum party on a plantation. Yeah. That's what I know. And then the host supposedly defended the girl and said something about, like, this happened in 2018, and this would have been acceptable in 2018. Well, the first thing I would have done, <laughs> to the degree that all that's right, great to the degree that the, all that's not right. I'm just letting you know the data I'm operating off of. Mm-hmm. Okay? So, so to the degree that that's correct, in an ideal world, before he ever got on an interview, somebody should have been prepping him to say, let's talk about, this is going to come up in the interview. Let's, like, let's be honest, you're being interviewed by a black woman. This is going to come up in the mm-hmm. interview. Let's prepare you for what an appropriate comment is so that he had the tools to respond such that he didn't show up, as I understand it, defending this person, which then backfired on him in the front of, in the face of another person, a part of the franchise, who's an African-American woman. So I use that as an example to say, one, you are now responsible for what you do know and what you don't know. And the season is over where people are giving uh, on the whole grace and forgiveness. And, and that's part of our cancel culture. Mm-hmm. So now you've got people who, you know, you say something and it gets put on the internet and I don't know how these people do it, but they find out where you work and who your boss is and all of these other things. And then that puts the organization in a space where they're forced to respond. Mm-hmm. They're just forced to respond. And because of what I said earlier about the d- diversity of the organization changing, the landscape and the expectations of what it means to be inclusive are changing, you now are forced to have to say, you know, Central Park Karen, you're fired. Mm-hmm. You know, 
athlete on the Olympic team storming the Capitol in your Olympic, you know, jacket, you're fired. You know, a woman on a plane, on a private jet going to storm the Capitol, you're fired, right? So mm-hmm. there's all of these cases where people have put themselves into these positions because they've made public statements unaware that the rules have changed. Yes. There are real life repercussions for the things that employees or people as part of a franchise, such as Chris Harrison, who's the Bachelor host, decide to do and say and the stand that they make. And I love you pointing out that it is now the responsibility of organizations to say we will no longer tolerate X, Y and Z. And our stance is here's what we will tolerate. And also the responsibility of the employee to know that if you're going to do some things such as storming the Capitol, you can be fired. Look at your contract. <laughs> right, right, right. And so organizationally, organizations have had to now say, what is our policy? Mm-hmm. Right? And, and what behavior, if you do it off work, what behavior can we and can we not hold you accountable for? And when are you a private citizen? And when are you a brand ambassador for our brand? Mm -hmm. And does that brand ambassadorship stop, you know, just because you're walking your dog in Central Park? For Franklin Templeton, the answer was no. Mm -hmm. And it, it depends on the organization, but it's the responsibility of leaders to begin to have those conversations with their employees because their employees don't know. Mm-hmm. You know, they're, they're not, they're not aware that if you get on entertainment tonight and give an interview, you know, you may have to take a step back from your hosting responsibilities. Mm-hmm. They don't know that. Yeah. Uh, it's, that's, it's so interesting to think about it in that perspective. Let's talk a little bit about marginalized communities and marginalized people in organizations and in kind of broader society, I think there's this idea that if we allow somebody, you know, me as a white woman, if I allow a person of color to be given the same concessions that I've been given or to be allowed the um, opportunities to grow in an organization that somehow that's putting me now at a disadvantage. So there's this idea that if if they then get opportunities that I will no longer have the opportunity. I don't know if you want to dig into that a little bit. It's something that I find so fascinating in our collective psyche that it's an, if they, then this can't happen. So I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So you know that I, you know, I'm getting a PhD in metaphysics and I know that you're a student of the topic And so, you know, what you're talking about in terms of this notion of a zero sum game is a metaphysical problem Mm -hmm. and right, wrong, or indifferent. If you believe that you're working off of a a singular pie and there are only eight slices of it. And if I eat two, that means that you're not going to get enough. You will continue to behave in that way. And, you know, we have, we have a lot of logistical problems in this country relative to how we have widened the chasm that exists between Mm. people who have economic stability and people who don't. And we have convinced people without economic stability that the reason they don't have it is because of other brown people. Yes. Right. And so if you have bought into that notion, then when a, a minority person shows up, the, the narrative is this person is taking something from me. Metaphysically, that's not even possible. And we don't have enough time, as you well know, <laughs> to unpack why that's not true. Mm-hmm. But that's not true. And so ultimately, you've got to get to the place organizationally where you're demonstrating that the best person for the job gets the job. You're demonstrating that you know, you have a particular standard of behavior and wherever people Mm -hmm. fall short from the C-suite to the new hire, they're going to be held accountable for that behavior. If you don't do that, then you put yourself and your organization at significant risk. Mm. Yes, well said. So something else that I think about in terms of, um, I think as women, we experience it, but oftentimes, um, you know, we see it with, Uh, populations of people of color and namely that is 
microaggressions in the workplace. I think it's a word, microaggressions is a word that's been tossed around. Uh, I, I sometimes think it's hard for people to grasp. What does that really mean in terms of how that plays out? So can you give an example of what those are? And even from your personal experience or seeing that in the workplace as well? Yeah, so they come in three forms. There's a great, if you Google, Google Forbes and micro uh, um, aggressions, there's a great article that will show up um, to give you some context about this for, for folks that are watching. But there are three kinds of, of microaggressions. There's micro assaults, micro invalidations, um, and micro assaults, invalidations, and I forgot the third one now. Of course I did. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, when you think about, I think the reason I'm stuck on invalidations is because I just did this training with a client yesterday and we walked through the three kinds of, of microaggressions and we were talking about ethnic hair and mm. we had had the organization go through and uh, people in the organization actually gave us the scenarios of what we were working through that had happened to them in the last year. And so this hair scenario, when we did it, people in the, in the audience, the, the employees in the organization were like, this is still happening? Yes, it's still happening in 2021. Mm. Hi, welcome to the party. Mm -hmm. And so um, the other thing that was interesting was we, we did a scenario around um, just this notion of what happens in the dynamics of meetings. So this is a, a really big invalidation. You're in a meeting and you make a suggestion and people ignore it. And 20 minutes later, somebody else in the room says the same thing you said. And it's like the best idea ever, <laughs> you know? And, and what happens is when you're in a marginalized community and then that happens to you, that is just even further marginalization. To be clear, when we did this training yesterday, I asked the question, how many of you have either seen this or had, it, had, them hap had this happen to you? Every single person said, yes, they've either seen it or had, had it happen to them. So when I said earlier, when you can get the culture right for your most marginalized, everybody thrives. These are the kinds of things that we're talking about, where you get organizations to the space and place where they can show mm -hmm. up, people can show up and treat people in an equitable fashion mm -hmm. and not put themselves or the organization in a space and a place where there's going to be potential legal ramifications, potential brand management ramifications, potential employment ramifications. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's so important. I think for people to understand that point and, and how, I mean, I'm no, I'm just, I mean, I've experienced it myself. I'm sure you probably have and how, uh, demoralizing and demotivating it can be on a daily basis in the workplace, but also, as you said, those those major ramifications. So, you know, we, we kind of touched on this a little bit at the beginning of our conversation, but May, um, as we know, George Floyd was murdered here um, in Minnesota, in Minneapolis, and it marked a point, um, well, what seemed to me is that it marked a point in time in American history where people were, you know, taking to the streets to protest all of the injustices. Do you feel that um, we are now at a point or more than a point, it's it's more of a less of a moment and more of a movement in time where things will begin to change for the better um, in American society and also in American companies and organizations for people of color? You know, the honest answer is, I don't know, Amanda. I, you know, I don't, I don't know. Um, and, and I say that because, you know, my, my father was born in 1941. I'm sorry, 1939. And he died in 2021, 20, 2020. He died in April from COVID. And I, I have a feeling if I were to ask him that question, mm. he would tell me that nothing has changed. It just looks different. Hmm. And so I, I don't know, you know, I'm cautiously optimistic. I think that because of the ways in which the landscape of the nation has changed and the projections of how it will continue to change, that's requiring different things of people. But as long as we hold this like a zero sum game, like I'm taking something from you, people are not going to give up power freely. Mm. 
right? Because there's something at risk for them. And I, I, I want to just, just to clarify, there's three kinds, insults, invalidations, and assaults. Thank I, you. I couldn't leave <laughs> that where it was. So uh, just the, the, the diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging expert in me was like, no, you, you need to like, what, what's, the, what's the one you forgot? So, um, so that's what they are. Thank you. You're welcome. I, I, I do hope we are at some form of reckoning in this, in this kind of confluence of things that are going on, not only, you know, with kind of white folk waking up to uh, what um, our, you know, friends and neighbors and people of color in this country have been dealing with for whatever, call it forever in this nation, um, and are starting to come to a point where they put themselves in a position to educate themselves and also to question the own lens under which they view the world. Um, I really do hope so. And a part of, you know, why we host and hold these conversations for Vino Karma is to bring people to the table to break bread proverbially, Um, you know, in a pre COVID times we were in person and um, hopefully we'll be able to do that soon, but also to explore their own, um, individual DNA and by which, you know, their own personal history and why they are where they are in this moment in time. And also to try to listen and hear in a different way to take their own action for change. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think part of what I would say in answer to this question is this notion that life is happening for us, not to us. And so the truth of the matter is in my opinion, the reason that there's been this galvanization and this exploration and this conversation is because people were stuck in the house and for about Mm. two weeks every day for 86 minutes, they watched a man kneel on somebody else's neck, Mm -hmm. 86 seconds, excuse me. And so when that happens to you, every day for two weeks and you're, you know, a white woman living, you know, wherever in the world, and you're trying to explain to your five-year-old child, why is this white man have his knee on this man's neck and he's calling for his mother? Hmm. It puts you in a position emotionally. I mean, you know, doctors are talking about the fact that the whole country experienced PTSD from that experience. Mm -hmm. The problem is, or the challenge is African-Americans have known that that's been happening every day in this nation for more than 450 years. So we were not phased by it, right? We had Orlando Castillo and, Mm -hmm. you know, and Sandra Bland who died in custody. And I mean, there's this, this laundry list of names that we could say. And so part of the reason that the majority population feels like this is new is because they have a level of awareness that people in brown bodies already had. Mm -hmm. They're waking up to a different reality that's causing them now to have to ask different questions. And so I think that that's the space of hope from my perspective. Mm -hmm. The fact that, you know, this happened at a time where so many people could see it, but the question just becomes, at what point do people get tired and move on? Because we, we are a society that consistently gets tired and moves on to the next conversation. Mm-hmm. And so I think we're at a potential tipping point because the changes in demographic are going to require that organizations get this right. It's going to, requ- if you want to retain and advance good talent, good talent is requiring that you have a diverse organization or they're not staying. Mm-hmm. whether they're white or red or green or purple, they're saying, I want to be a, a associated with an organization that values diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. And if that's not you, I will take my talents, you know, to quote LeBron James to Miami, <laughs> 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 you know? And so, so I think it's just, it's just important that organizations really understand you're at a tipping point. Mm-hmm. And if you don't get this right, you're not going to be able to recruit the talent you need to do the work of your organization because we're already in a talent crunch and it's just going to get worse. And 20 years from now, it's going to get really bad because people aren't having babies right now because they're freaking out because of COVID. Yeah. That has has a 20 year impact when you're getting Mm -hmm. ready to hire people. Right. Mm -hmm. So So true. 
So there's, there are all of these things that are happening that people aren't necessarily thinking about because our culture and what has gotten rewarded in organizations has been next quarter, not 20 years from now. Mm, mm, Such a powerful point. I will say that I think that the people that are having babies right now are those who have been tuning into D nice in all of quarantine. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Outside yeah. of that, I don't know what the rest of America's doing. Um, <laughs> so, That's awesome. Um, so let's uh, let's talk a little bit about that important point you just made, which is, you know, what organizations need to get right. And part of I think the question that comes to my mind is, you know, with these tough conversations or these courageous conversations or the conversations that just need to be had that are now happening in organizations, how can white supervisors, managers leaders make space for and advocate for their um, employees, their black and brown employees? Yeah, I think it starts with being ready, willing, and able not to take this conversation personally, Mm. right? One of the things that we hear all the time is, well, you know, if, if we use Chris Harris's example, you know, well, it wasn't a working plantation. Okay. That's true. It wasn't a working plantation. It still was a plantation. It still has symbolism, right? And we know that symbols matter. If, if they didn't, Nike wouldn't have trademarked the swoosh. Mm-hmm. Okay? And so at the end of the day, you've got to be ready to not take these things personally and recognize that there's a collective conversation that needs to be had that you benefit from as a white mm-hmm. person. Mm-hmm. Whether you owned a slave or not, whether you, you know, um, voted for a person who put, you know, people in cages in 2020 or the person who put people in cages in 1980. Mm-hmm. Either way, you're voting for somebody who put somebody in cages. So at the end of the day, you have to just be really clear. There's impact to that. There's impact to to where you're choosing to align yourself and how you're choosing to view what's happening. And if you're taking this personally, you then don't have space for conversation. And I bring up the point about people in cages because I I think it's important to understand neither one of those people is right or wrong. Like, that's just what happened, right? There was the crime bill in the 80s. There are are Mexican children who've been separated from their families in detention centers in 2020. So- I, I don't have a dog in that fight and being able to say, was Trump right or was Biden right? Like, that's not the debate. The, ba- the debate in my mind is, what do you do when you recognize 50% of your employees voted for one person and 50% of your employees voted for the other? And these two populations don't get along. And if, if in fact, they can't create a space to listen to each other and to not be offended, it's going to be really hard to then say, yes, I'm going to sponsor and advocate for someone who looks different than me when mm-hmm. I can't even agree. I mean, the, the letter was just released for, I think it was a legislature, a, a legislator whose family released a letter who was horrified that he voted to impeach President Trump. And they were just on two sides of the aisle, right? So if you've got that kind of infighting in your own family, how are you navigating that in your organization? And what does that mean for you as a leader? What it means for you as a leader is you've got to be really steeped in the organization's values and really clear about the expectations of how people get work done in your organization Mm -hmm. and be 100% sure about what you are and are not willing to tolerate in terms of how people show up every day Mm -hmm. and have the tools in place to hold those people accountable. Mm, And that's big. That takes work because we aren't in the habit of holding people accountable because we don't hold people accountable for not moving cases. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And so now you want, you want to hold me accountable for an action I took, you know, off, off site or because I made an offhanded comment or because I said, you know, I, I'm not going to make a comment about what this woman did, you know, at a sorority party two years ago until she speaks. Well, well, okay, okay, <laughs> okay. I think this this goes into sort of you know that back to part of the conversation we started around the end consumer and the cancel culture and thinking about brands and messaging and the things that we've seen you know through 
um, you know, whether it's mainstream bachelorette or things that are just tone deaf. So what do you know, we're talking, obviously, we, you know, with Vino Karma, we're hosting a conference in May where we're talking about diversity, equity, inclusion and innovation and highlighting up and coming brands um, in this space. And it's, uh, yeah, I mean, offline, we can talk about how interesting it's been to have conversations with some of these larger organizations about the conference we're having. Um, But I'm curious to know, you know, so if we put it out on that brand lens and how certain, let's call it, you know, beverages, wines, beer, spirits are going to market, you know, what are those things that they need to be thinking about as it trickles down to the end consumer and who actually has the purchasing power to buy their brands? Yeah, I mean, I think I think about um, I think about this in a couple of ways. Um, especially, I've been thinking about this because of because of the spirits conversation, right? And I think about this when you overlay rap culture. Mm-hmm. So if if you overlay rap culture to the conversation, there's there's a great story about Jay Z and how Jay Z used to endorse Cristal and then something happened and I don't know the details of what, of what happened, or let me say it this way. I'm not going to talk about the details of what happened. Um, but at, at, at the end of that, he chose to start his own liquor brand. And as a result, Crystal got, it wasn't talked about as much mm-hmm. and it impacted their bottom line significantly, right? The same thing happened with vodka right now. P Diddy owns his own vodka. Mm -hmm. So, so so you're in a situation where um, you have to understand who's consuming your product and what is their purchasing power. The African American community in the United States has over a trillion dollars worth of purchasing power as a as a collective community. We're not talking about net worth. We're just talking about annual purchasing power. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, is that a market you want to speak to? If so, you know, people like LeBron James and Jay-Z have influence over the consumable decisions in that community. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So that's so that's one piece of it. And then the other piece of it or another piece of it is who are you trying to recruit from a talent perspective and what are their expectations of you? So now you're in a situation where organizations are dealing with the fact that people won't come work there because there's not a senior leader who looks like them. Oh yeah. Right. And so that's a set of problems that organizationally you have to decide and make a strategy about and, and determine how soon you want to solve that problem. And in industries like the wine industry, like the tech industry, where historically there haven't been people of color and women, if your definition of qualified is they've done this for 20 years, you're not going to have a qualified candidate. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the challenges that bo- that boards and organizations are dealing with in the wake of Goldman Sachs announcement saying that they're not going to bring a company public unless they put have a woman on their board is if you're saying you're qualified to be in board service, if you used to be a CEO, well, the pool of female CEOs is mm-hmm. like, you know, not that many. So you've got to look at how you're determining quali- qu- what is qualified. And if you're going to be equitable and you find a person who's in alignment with your values, who you believe you can get up to speed, do you take that risk on them? It's a decision organizations ha- have to make. Mm-hmm. The other thing that, that companies have to start to think through and leaders have to start think, to think through are the promises that they've made to employees. So, You've got a succession plan. You've got a pipeline. You've told John he's going to get the next VP spot. Then the world goes crazy. And now you, your organization has said we need to get to 50% women at the VP level, which means John's not going to get the job. So, so now you need to figure out how you're going to have a conversation with John to say, look, John, you know, the landscape has shifted and you're not going to get the job anymore. And, and to be okay with that conversation, I recognize that doesn't feel fair to John. It doesn't feel fair to you as a leader. And so organizationally, one of the things we spend a significant amount of time with leaders around is what do you do about that problem? What are the conversations that you go and have with John? 
How do you navigate those discussions? How do you, you know, as a person who wants to be in integrity, think about your succession plan and the commitments that you've made to people recognizing that you've got some different objectives potentially now. Mm. So you've got to think as a leader, there's a lot to unpack. And as part of this journey, people have to be willing to be kind to themselves, recognizing that cult- cancer culture may not be kind to you. And so you've got to make sure that you're being kind to yourself and that you're thinking not only about your intent, but about the impact that you're going to have and whether or not you've opened yourself up for some ripple effect you're not intending. Mm. I mean, all of those pieces, just the intent, the impact, the words you're using, everybody watching this and people who will be lucky enough to have time with you in May. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, Just really thinking that through. And these are critical questions that, you know, even as you approach, everybody approaches who has an outward brand, because now we all do. We're all personal brands in our own right. I'm just thinking through how you actually go to market and go to the world was kind of cracking me up when you were saying like, oh, you know, thinking through, like if you don't have 20 years of experience, what does that talent look like you're bringing up? And my own experience in the wine industry, I worked when I came back to America, I worked for a distributor and it was like such a joke to me because the heads of our division were all white men. And, you know, I would talk to them about my former experience outside of America, but also, you know, the fact I have a business degree and all of these things. And it was like, yeah, you know, you're not qualified for this. And I would look at who actually was in those positions and none of them were truly qualified except for the fact they came up through the old, the good old boys network and somebody went to college with somebody and somebody was in somebody's frat And it was just like, it always was like, this system is so broken and such a joke. So I ended up leaving and starting my own company. But, you know, it's one of those things where you're just like, it's so um, poorly designed and poorly thought out on all levels. So I totally, I I hear you. (laughs) Yeah, and, And what happens is good people just go somewhere else to thrive. You know, and I I think about the companies that I've worked for and, you know, in the last six months, a woman I worked for at one of my previous companies just got named, you know, chief people officer for a brand you drive by every day. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, somebody else who I interned with, who's an African-American is now, you know, head of sales for a brand you use every day you know, but they're not at the companies we started with, you know, Mm -hmm. they're not working for the three organizations that I worked for. And this is not about those three organizations. This is about the systemic issues related to promotion and advancement and opportunity. And in some cases, there just was a bottleneck, right? Mm -hmm. One organization in particular, there's just a bottleneck. There's lots of talent and there's no place for the talent to go. So Mm -hmm. whether it's white or black or green or purple, it's going to have to go somewhere else to get promoted. Mm -hmm. In other cases, there's lots of space for the talent to go, but those organizations can't keep the talent there Yeah, because the culture um, and the expectations and the environment says, if you're a white man, you know, we already know this research shows if you're, you're a white man, if you're 30% ready for a job, you'll say, coach, put me in mm-hmm. if you're a woman. You believe you have to be 110% ready for the job, even to be asked. And you need to be about hundred percent ready for the job for people to, you know, give you a shot at it. Mm-hmm. So one of the things organizations have to figure out is how do you take reasonable risks on talent? How do you ensure that there's some infrastructure to support them to grow and develop and not screw up your business? And we help organizations map that out all the time. I mean, in in our executive coaching relationships, we deal with these issues and help them unpack. How do you ensure if you're going to put a person in a job that they're going to thrive in that job? And if they're not thriving, what are the, you know, what are the guardrails? What are the, you know, Mm -hmm. the bumpers that you're putting in the, in the gutter ball lanes to make sure that this, this opportunity doesn't go off the rails for them. Mm -hmm. And that requires a level of work that, feels like additional work to people. But the truth of the matter is when you've promoted John, because John was your fraternity brother in your example earlier, you naturally do that with John. 
Mm-hmm. You don't think about the fact that you naturally do that with John. So when you're asked to do it with, you know, Amanda, it feels like, well, how am I supposed to do that? Well, you already know how to do that because you do it with John all the time. Mm-hmm. It's about giving people access to that knowledge and helping them then reapply it in this new context. Mm. That's great. So, yeah, um, I, I feel like we could talk all day about these topics. Um, what is the one thing you, you advise all leaders to take on as they navigate their DEI journey? Yeah, the place we always start is, is what are you holding people accountable to? Hmm. You've got to be clear what you're holding people accountable to. And the question is, is a violation of your diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging policy, uh, is your accountability designed up to an including termination? Or is it something less than that? And if it's something less than that, what will the something less than that create in your culture? Mm -hmm. And that's a question every leader needs to sit with. And there are things that you can do that aren't, you know, necessarily a violation. And you, you know, yes, you can recover from that. I'm not suggesting that everybody's policy should be up to and including termination, but I am suggesting that you need to be clear about what your boundary is. And you also need to be clear because the laws are changing what you're doing with employees who are breaking the law in your workplace, because you're responsible for a harassment free work environment. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to start to be navigating out these issues so that everybody in the organization is crystal clear about what happens when things go awry. Very well said. So for those people who are watching, that could be leaders, it could be Um, line managers, it could be employees of organizations of all types, or they might have, they might be entrepreneurs. Are there any resources that you love um, or books or uh, podcasts or videos or anything you love where if people are just starting to scratch the surface into these topics that you could point them into? Oh, goodness. Where do we start? I think (laughs) from, from from a leadership skill perspective, Um, Although this is not a diversity, equity, and inclusion resource, it's a really good leadership resource. It's a book called Scaling Leadership um, by uh, Robert Anderson and William Adams. Um, And I just think that they really do articulate the skills necessary to show up powerfully as a leader and to be able to navigate all of this uncertainty in a way that stays grounded and creates opportunity for yourself Mm -hmm. and others. Um, You know, Robin's book on right fragility is excellent. I think she's done a really good job of outlining what's happening and why to the question you asked me earlier, people get so defensive and what to do with that level of defense. Um, I really like uh, Tihanisha Coates' work. I think he's done an excellent oh. job um, of really outlining these issues, really you know, dot, delving deep and having really meaningful conversations. I think um, the Executive Leadership Council just released a study in 2019 about being Black in corporate America, and there's a, there's a treasure trove of information in there, um, including the fact that uh, white women are not perceived as allies by African Americans. I mean, there's a bunch of great data uh, that they've been able to glean with the work that they do. I think you know, there's, there's lots of places that you could go. It, it, it just depends on what your objective really is, what you're trying to unpack in your organization mm-hmm. and how you want to be rewarding people for the actions you do or don't want them to take. Mm-hmm. All great uh, resources. And I appreciate that. Before we give a little plug into your appearance at the Vito Carver Conference, is there anything else that I haven't asked you today or anything else that's top of mind for you that you'd like to share with our audience? I guess I would just leave you with this thought. You are responsible for both your intent and your impact. And because you can't Mm -hmm. control people's responses you have to be really clear about your intent and make sure that your actions are in alignment with that Mm -hmm. because you can't control how people are going to respond. 
The other thing I would say is this is a journey for people and about half the population is still giving grace and about half the population isn't. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, you need to give yourself some grace as you're continuing to learn on the journey, as you're continuing to try and make your organization and make your teams more inclusive to really get the innovation lift that happens with when you have leveraged diversity on your team. And that's going to take intent. Mm -hmm. And it's going to take a level of patience and a level of kindness to yourself so that you can stay in a really emotionally messy place sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah, that's great advice. And I really appreciate that. So two more quick things for people who want to learn more about Cornelia and her team and her work, please check her out at, it's at 3cconsulting.com. That's right. And we'll also make sure that we put the URL and everything, um, but please go check Cornelia and her team out. And the last thing is Cornelia will be joining us for the Vino Karma Conference on May 6th, where she will be hosting a fireside chat to talk about all of the questions organizations need to be asking themselves about diversity, equity, inclusion, and representation that they aren't yet asking themselves. So we will be crowdsourcing some questions prior to that conversation. Um, So there's no shame in the conversation at all. And kind of putting Cornelia on the hot seat by leveraging her expertise, her deep expertise in this area and the work that she does in corporate. So Cornelia, um, I cannot thank you enough for this conversation today. As I said, we could talk for hours and then that would mean I'd have to like break open a couple of these bottles of wine behind me. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) uh, But I really appreciate you and I appreciate um, you showing up the way you showed up today and um, all of the nuggets, like truly all of the sound bites that you gave this community and all of the things that you gave each and every single one of us to think about. So cheers to you and the work that you do and continue to go out there and create change, as we say, one step at a time. So thank you, Cornelia. 